The next uh, book we'll consider in the, uh, the Minor Prophets is the book of Jonah. It's a very interesting book. And an un unbelievable book to many. Well, we'll get into it and uh, see what it has for us. But uh, at the moment, will you bow with me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the love that Thou hast given us and that Thou hast left us guidance as to how we are to conduct ourselves in this life. And we're grateful, Father, for, for the access we have to Thy knowledge and wisdom as recorded upon these pages from Thy prophets. We pray that we and everyone who hears these words will be blessed in the hearing and that we will have a determination to do what it instructs us to do. We're grateful for the grace that has been provided to us through thy Son, Jesus Christ. May we ever prepare ourselves to be meet for his service. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. The book of Jonah is uh, unique in a, a number of different ways. <clears throat> it's really a very, it's a very short book, and it's one that many consider to be either a myth or allegorical, but it just, it's, it's a uh, spoken of and written in a, in a way that's uh, historical but many say well it can't be historical because you know he got this big fish in it <laughs> I think we need to keep in mind uh, and of course it has the the storms and the vines and gourd and all that stuff but I think the real hang up for a lot of people is the fish and that the fish swallowed Jonah and he was inside the fish for three days. He said, that just can't be. Well, <clears throat> was Jesus raised from the dead? If you can believe that, then you can believe that there was a, a fish that swallowed Jonah. Now, I think you need to keep in mind also the uh, uh, difference between miracles and acts of God. In the insurance business, uh, you know, legal, legalese business, there is a concept called an act of God. You'll find it in a lot of the insurance contracts. It'll talk about that. And that's just something that is it's a natural phenomenon that not, cannot necessarily be predicted or prevented. And a lot of times insurance companies won't cover acts of God. Sometimes they will, but sometimes they won't. But here, you know, we should keep in mind the difference between acts of God and miracles. The fact that there's a, a big fish that can swallow Jonah and then actually comes up and swallows him. Uh, it may just be a, an act of God using something natural. You know, no uh, miracle is something where the uh, natural law is set aside, something that could not happen naturally does happen, and uh, consequently, it's, it's, uh, we call that a miracle. Of course, nowadays, for the most part, the natural things that happen, people call them miracles, and the miracle things they don't believe happened. You know, with the birth of a baby or this, that, the other, or they're in a car wreck and they're not hurt, and say, well, that's a miracle. Well, it's not a miracle. So, but anyway, one thing in the book of Jonah I know is a miracle is that Jonah could survive three days inside the uh, inward parts of a fish or whatever it was, whatever creature it was. I know that's a miracle. 
But anyway, uh, that's why uh, a lot of uh, people, especially uh, critics of the Bible, uh, do not accept Jonah as a historical book, but is written as history, and it is inspired. And if it's written as history and inspired, then the history has to be true. If it's not inspired, the history doesn't have to be true, but it is inspired, so the history has to be true. And the uh, I think the primary lesson uh, of the book of Jonah is that uh, uh, God wants to save everybody, even, even the heathen. You know, this is the second time that a book has been written about the uh, heathen people, God's love and concern for the heathen people. And so therefore, if God has a love for the heathen people and wants them to be saved as well as his own chosen people, then that means that God is the God of everyone. Even those who do not uh, accept him, do not believe him, in him, he is still the God of those people, and they will be held, have to answer to him. There's, there's some uh, lessons to be learned from Jonah. One is that national <coughs> sin, in this case it was a, the uh, national sin of the Ninevites or the, uh, the Syrians, National sin demands national repentance. Now, that is of some concern today. I don't think there's anyone here that would deny that there is a national sin that infects this nation. And of course it infects a lot of other nations too. We're not the only ones but it infects this nation. And typically, where there's no political will to, uh, for national repentance, there will be no national repentance. Mm -hmm. Can you name anyone in Washington now that has that political will to plead for the uh, spiritual well-being of this nation? Who is it? There is no one. I don't care which party you're talking about. There is no one. Another lesson to be learned, uh, and of course Jonah found out, is that you can't run from God. You can't hide from him. You can't run away from him. So whenever there's a task to be done, and there are a lot of things that... Uh, must be done in the church or in, or in Christian living that are unpleasant. You just don't like to do them. They're not pleasant. Put you at odds with uh, other people. When you stand for the truth of necessity, that means that you must oppose error. It also means that there must be somebody that's uh, propagating that error. So to, pro to oppose the error, you got to oppose the person that's propagating the error. Maybe you're friend, maybe a family member. So it's not always a pleasant thing to do, but if you cannot run away from God, if you must be held accountable to God, the best thing to do, even though it's an unpleasant, an unpleasant task, is to go ahead and do it. Get it done. Get it behind you. It has to be done. Just go ahead and do it. You can't run away from it. Another lesson to be learned is that uh, God can use all the um, happenings in your life, all the instances, good or bad, they can use them all for your uh, good and His glory. Now, I say that we may not always recognize things to be blessings. I know in David's class we're talking about where there must be divisions among you. 
and nobody likes divisions, but you, in order to be able to tell whether one is uh, of the faith or not, sometimes you need those divisions to help you. So in, in some sense, that sort of division is a blessing. It's a good thing. Not pleasant, but it's a good thing. <clears throat> so God can use all the things that happen to us for our good if, if we will just uh, recognize the goodness that comes from it. And that's something. That's a, a, a lesson that, uh, of course, Jonah had to learn. Another lesson to be learned is that <clears throat> uh, where there's opportunity, there's uh, uh, obligations, there's uh, challenges. Opportunities don't come for free. They must be paid for. So Jonah had an opportunity to do something that was very good, but he didn't like it. It was a challenge to him, and he ran from it. Another lesson that can be learned from Jonah is that it's a contrast between the love and, and concern that God has for all men and the lack of love and concern that man has for all men. When it comes to someone's uh, material um, thing, sustenance, and what have you, they can be very particular about uh, their concern for uh, other individuals. And this was a lesson that was uh, at least demonstrated to Jonah. Whether he learned it or not, I don't know. It says that uh, there's always a political aspect to these things. And, you know, Assyria, uh, you know, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria at various times. But, as, but uh, Assyria was having, let's say, political difficulties at this time, at the time that uh, Jonah was to go to preach to him. They had some... Uh, um, internal disturbances, they had uh, some external disturbances. And so they were kind of in a uh, vulnerable uh, situation. And it may be that because of this vulnerability that they had, political, it may have been just a great time to, to preach to them about their spiritual condition. And I think that's a lesson for us to learn that sometimes you can't reach someone until they are, are really in some sort of uh, uh, awkward or difficult situation for, for whatever reason it may be. You know, if, if everything's good, the stock market's up, the, uh, the uh, 401k is doing great. Uh, you know, you got plenty of money in the bank. You may not be concerned about hearing anything about, you know, your own soul's condition. But take all that away. It may be an opportune time to present the gospel to someone like that. So you have to take advantage of the situation as it arises. And I think this was the case with. Uh, uh, Nineveh. He says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. They were, Syrians were known as a wicked people. They're very uh, wicked, so this is uh, not something that's new to, to Jonah, but they are also uh, political competitors, if you will, to Israel, and they had to be a, at least some 
harsh feelings between the nation of Israel and uh, Assyria. And of course, eventually that bore itself out. But they were known for their wickedness. Nineveh is a great city. Nineveh was fairly close to the present day uh, uh, Baghdad. It, it's somewhere in that area, not exactly the same place, but close to it. And the city that that uh, Jonah was from was fairly close to Bethlehem. So it's not just a short distance. And the way they traveled in those times, it, it would have taken some time to get to Nineveh. But anyway, he's instructed to go out, and, and here he's to cry out against the Ninevites. And exactly what crying out is, you know, we'll learn that a little bit later on. But Jonah wasn't happy with that. He considered the Assyrians the political enemies of Israel. He wanted to see them destroyed. And he knew what would happen if they uh, went and preached to the uh, Ninevites. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Now, Tarshish was a province of present-day Spain. So you, you think about where he is, somewhere around uh, uh, Nazareth, and he had to go to Joppa. Joppa was the closest port there, and he, and he got on a ship there. So he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now here is someone that... Uh, he was a Hebrew, he admits that later on, Hebrew and he was a worshiper of the Jehovah God. He should know that you cannot go away from the presence of God. I think David mentioned the 139th Psalm, just read that. You can't get away from God. It's not possible. So, in verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now, is this great wind, is that a uh, miracle or an act of God? Well, we have great winds all the time, but the fact that it came up all of a sudden, well, miracle or an act of God, is, it happened. Then the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to his God. You know, these were heathen people. They cried out to their gods, whoever they were. And threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea. They wanted to lighten the ship up so uh, to get it higher in the water so it wouldn't take on the water uh, to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, laying down and was fast asleep. Now, he may have done that before the storm came, you know, given the uh, stress that he was under by trying to flee from God, you know, sometimes, especially when you get older, I, I don't know about you young folks, but when you get older, stress, you know, kind of makes you tired and sleepy. <laughs> so he may have been uh, uh, due for a, a little nap. So he, he went down to the hole and, and went to sleep. So in verse 6, the captain came to him, and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Rise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Now here you have uh, a heathen, a worshiper of all in any number of different gods. He's the one that had to come to a believer in the, the Jehovah, the one true God. He had to come to him and ask him to pray. It should have been the other way around. He says, Arise, call on your God, and perhaps your God will consider us so that we, uh, that we may not perish. In verse 7, So they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know 
for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And it was very common at that time to, when they're trying to decide something to, to use lots. It, uh, you know, you know, the, heard of the Urim and Thummim uh, in the uh, Old Testament? And there was uh, someone in the New Testament that was selected by a lot. Matthias, yeah, to replace uh, Judas. He was selected by, by lot. So that was not uncommon. And keep in mind, again, that these are uh, heathen people. They're very superstitious. And to them, you know, casting a lot, uh, they may not have known it, but they were playing into God's plan. But they just thought, well, you know, our gods would uh, give us uh, the answer to our questions if we just cast these lots. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So they want to know more about him as to why it is that this calamity had befallen them and what uh, Jonah had to do with it. And Jonah told him, said uh, in verse 9, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Well, that's what he, a believing Hebrew should say, but he was not acting in accordance with his statement of faith here. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? You know, if you have a God that's that great, obviously you can't get away from it, so why did you do it? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And in verse 12, Jonah said, And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me in the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Well, that was very noble on his part, to admit his guilt and to disclose the remedy to their situation. Far better than they have never gotten in that situation to begin with by being obedient to the will of God. And I'm, I'm sure that the mariners were impressed with that, that he would uh, uh, advise them to resort to such an extreme measure. So, verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. And you have to imagine the fragility of those ships of that time and just how uh, the storms could rage upon the Mediterranean Sea. You know, we've got the Great Lakes, and there have been a number of cases of uh, a lot of warships that uh, apply the uh, Great Lakes. And there have been many of those that have sunk because of the storms on the Great Lakes. And they were a lot sturdier ships than these were. But anyway, they continued to row, thinking that they could uh, uh, save themselves, but they couldn't. The sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. They, therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you O Lord have done as it pleased you well that's uh, admirable confession on their part and that does mean that they became uh, uh, converted to the one true God but they recognized power when they saw it 
And it's interesting that they didn't want this blood to be uh, charged to them. But there was a later event in the New Testament where the Jews did say, let his blood be upon us. That's during the uh, trial and demand for crucifixion of Jesus. So the Jews said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Well, it certainly was. It certainly did happen. <clears throat> he says, uh, O Lord, uh, do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you, and it pleased the Lord that we should end this session at this moment. <laughs> so we'll pick up the uh, first chapter next week. Thank you.